Grace, Archbishop Collins, Sister Anne, Father de Souza, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology, dear friends of the University of St. Michael's College. As a former lecturer here in this Faculty of Theology, as a current member of the Collegium, and as a co-sponsor of this evening's event, it's a great privilege for me to introduce my friend and colleague, Father Barron, who is the speaker in this year's John M. Kelly Lecture in Theology at the University of St. Michael's. Father Robert Barron, as many of you know, is an acclaimed author, speaker, and theologian. He is the Francis Cardinal George Professor of Faith and Culture at Mundelein Seminary near Chicago. He's also the founder of Word on Fire. He is the creator and host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking 10-part documentary series and study program about the Catholic faith that is airing at present on public television throughout the United States and in various parts of the world. He's a passionate student of art, architecture, music, and history, which he calls upon throughout his global travels in the making of this historic documentary. Father Barron received his master's degree in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in Washington in 1982, and his doctorate in theology from the Institut Catholique de Paris in 1986. He's been a he was ordained to the priesthood in 1986, and has been a professor of systematic theology at the University of St. Mary of the Lake Mundelein since 1992. He has been visiting professor at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, and he was twice scholar in residence at the Pontifical North American College in Rome. His Word on Fire programs are broadcast regularly on the American WGN network, on Salt and Light Television here in Canada, on EWTN out of the United States, Relevant Radio, the popular Word on Fire YouTube channel, and the Word on Fire website, which so many of you are familiar with. He offers blogs, articles, commentaries, newscasts, sermon podcasts on an outstanding website. He's the first priest to have a national show on a secular television network since the 1950s. Of course, many of us remember another religious figure of the Catholic Church, Fulton Sheen. Bob is following Fulton Sheen. Tonight's lecture, will be televised on Salt and Light Television on October the 23rd. And through the generosity of Father Barron, he's given us permission to air his Catholicism series on our network later this fall. In that vein, I'd also like to call your attention to the fact that the Newman Center, down the road from here, will be running Father Barron's Catholicism series on, beginning on October the 31st and following every second Monday and the Newman Center staff is in the back to hand out brochures. When I personally think of Father Barron, the words of the psalmist come immediately to mind. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. This evening's speaker offers us a remarkable opportunity to understand the Church's urgent mission of proclaiming the good news to the entire world. The critical work of evangelization takes place through music, color, beauty, light, media, new media, and the arts. When I read Father Barron, as I've read for many years, or watch his groundbreaking creative work on television and on the internet, the words of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger in 1985 come to mind. Cardinal Ratzinger said, the only real effective apologia for Christianity comes down to two arguments, namely, the saints the Church has produced and the art which has grown in its womb. Christians, Cardinal Ratzinger said, must make their church into a place where beauty and hence truth is at home. And when so many people encounter Father Barron, as so many did in Madrid this summer, the very memorable words of the servant of God, Pope Paul VI, in his 1975 apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Nunciandi, come immediately to mind. Paul VI wrote, Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it's because they are witnesses. Please welcome among us this evening an artist, a teacher, and a witness who will speak to us on evangelizing the culture, Father Robert Barron. <laughs> 
Well, thank you all very much for that warm welcome. And Father Tom, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Sister Anne, thank you for your hospitality. Archbishop Collins, thank you for your kindness in inviting me to uh, deliver this historic lecture here, the Kelly Lecture. You know, it's my second visit to Toronto. I had the privilege today to go up to the uh, CN Tower. I was there at the very top, and my guide, a lovely lady from Salt and Light, said, you see that church steeple down there? <laughs> That's where you're speaking tonight. So I saw the church from way up high earlier today. Um, when I think of Toronto, I go back in my uh, imagination to when I was a teenager, and I was just getting into theology and religion. I was reading Thomas Aquinas and the medievals whom I loved, and it was the Toronto Medieval Institute that came to my mind. People like Anton Pegas and Etienne Gilson and many others. And so I associate Toronto with that great intellectual tradition that beguiled me very much when I was a young man. So it's a privilege to be at least on the same ground as that uh, institution and, and in this great place, which has been a, a center of learning for a long time. So thank you for giving me that privilege. As Father Ty mentioned, my uh, topic tonight is evangelizing the culture. I'll tell you a quick story before I start. Um, Cardinal Francis George, who's my boss in Chicago, was in Rome for the Ad Limina visit with John Paul II at the very end of John Paul's life. And the Cardinal made his report about the Archdiocese and the Pope listened very attentively. At the end of it, the Pope turned to Cardinal George and said, what are you doing to evangelize the culture? And if you know Cardinal George, he's almost never at a loss for words. But he said he was at a loss for words. He didn't quite know what to tell John Paul II. And when he got home, it bothered him. So he saw me at the seminary a few weeks later, and he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I want you to evangelize the culture. And I said, <laughs> I said, what does that mean? And he goes, well, we'll try to figure it out together, you know. So I've been thinking about it uh, for a long time, and I've been trying to practice it in the work that Father Tom was describing. So tonight is an attempt to, um, to name it theoretically as best I can. So what I'll do in the talk is first talk about what evangelization is, what a culture is, and then how to bring the two together. What does it mean to propose the risen Jesus to a culture? What does it mean to evangelize? I submit that to evangelize is to announce the good news, euangelion, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The first evangelists, Peter, Paul, James, Philip, had comparatively little to say about the teachings and actions of Jesus, but they couldn't stop talking about his resurrection from the dead. So insisted on this theme was St. Paul, that his sophisticated audience on the Areopagus in Athens thought he was declaring a new God called the Gnosticus, resurrection. Now, the resurrection carries with it many implications, but the most significant of its ramifications, I think, is its confirmation of Jesus' staggering claims in regard to his own person. Despite many suggestions to the contrary in both the wider culture and too often, I think, in the subculture of the Theological Academy, Jesus did not claim to be simply one religious figure among many, one more in a long line of prophets or symbols of God. The Jesus portrayed in the Gospels consistently spoke and acted in the very person of Yahweh, the God of Israel. To his disciples he said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. One could easily enough imagine a spiritual teacher saying that his followers should love God more than the highest goods in this world, but himself? To the paralyzed man, Jesus said, child, your sins are forgiven. Again, we could certainly imagine a spiritual teacher telling people to forgive those who would harm them, but who is this man who arrogates to himself the prerogative of actively forgiving the sins of someone's entire life? As the bystanders understandably observe, he is blaspheming, who but God alone can forgive sins. Defending his disciples against the charge of picking grain on the Sabbath, Jesus reminds his interlocutors that priests serving in the temple can, under certain circumstances, violate the Sabbath and still remain innocent. But then he adds, with breathtaking laconicism, I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. The Jerusalem temple was, for first century Jews, the dwelling place of Yahweh on earth, and hence the most sacred place imaginable. The only one who could reasonably claim to be greater than the temple would be the one who was, in fact, worshipped in the temple. 
In a number of places in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus blithely states, You've heard it said, but I say. What would have overwhelmed a first century Jewish audience is that almost casual dismissal of the Torah, the revelation given by Yahweh to Moses himself, and hence the court of final appeal to any pious Jew. Once more, the only one who could legitimately overrule the Torah with such insouciance would be the one who was himself the author of the Torah. Now, I've purposely chosen passages exclusively from the Synoptic Gospels in order to hold off the claim that the the divinity of Jesus is affirmed only in the later Johannine Gospel. In point of fact, John expresses explicitly and directly, the Word became flesh, I and the Father are one, he who sees me sees the Father, etc. He's expressing thereby the same truth that the Synoptics stated more implicitly and according to a different symbolic system. Now, as C.S. Lewis and many others have noted, these extraordinary claims could be explained as expressions of Jesus' madness or religious megalomania. Obviously, many who claim their own divinity can be found even today in hospitals for the insane. And though political considerations were undoubtedly at play, the principal reason why Jesus was put to death was precisely his blasphemous identification with the God of Israel. The one over whose cross was placed a sign declaring him to be the king of the Jews was being presented as a pathetically deluded character. But all such explanations even as before the event of the resurrection, Jesus returned from death as the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. The first Christians came to understand this mighty act of God as the ratification of Jesus' stunning claim to be Yahweh moving among his people. And this is why they called him Kyrios, Lord, a Greek rendering of the Hebrew Adonai, a term used to refer to the Holy One whose proper name, Yahweh, could not and should not be pronounced. Jesus Kyrios, Jesus is Lord, a phrase often on the lips and under the pens of the first evangelists, is one of the pithiest and most evocative charismatic formulas of the early church. To be sure, Kyrios had a Roman as well as a Hebrew overtone, for a watchword of that time and place was Kaiser Kyrios, Caesar is the Lord, a declaration of one's ultimate political and cultural allegiance. The edgy, subversive, dangerous quality of announcing the lordship of Jesus explains why many of the first Christians, Peter and Paul most famously, spent a fair amount of time in jail and were eventually put to death. If I might conjoin the Hebrew and the Roman senses of the charismatic declaration, the first evangelists were insisting that Jesus of Nazareth is God, and hence he's the figure to whom final allegiance is due in the political, cultural, and religious spheres. Everything they were saying belongs to him. Everything comes from him, leads to him, and finds its fulfillment in him. Listen now to the extravagant language used by Paul in Colossians. Quote, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. We find much the same idea in Philippians. Quote, Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every other name, the name of Yahweh, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Kyrios, to the glory of God the Father. To evangelize is to proclaim precisely this lordship of the risen Jesus. And if Paul is right in saying that every tongue must confess Jesus' lordship and every knee must bend in acknowledgement of it, evangelization cannot be a privatized affair. It has to take place publicly and boldly, though nonviolently, lest in the very act of declaring the crucified Savior we undermine him. And it must be directed to every individual and to every institution of culture. Now, If that's evangelization, what's culture? 
Culture, of course, is a famously slippery word, capable of being defined in any number of ways. I might propose, for our purposes, the following characterization. A culture is that whole conjuries of practices, beliefs, convictions, and institutions by which a people finds and expresses its collective identity. Now, every culture, it seems to me, develops out of three great transcendental drives toward the good, the true, and the beautiful. Thus, political, legal, and juridical systems are, at least in principle, ordered by the quest for the just or the morally good. Newspapers, universities, schools, the sciences, the internet, etc., are again, at least ideally, ordered to the pursuit of the true. And literature, theater, dance, music, painting, sculpture, television, and film are ordered, again at their best, to the production of the beautiful. What undergirds all of these cultural forms is some entelechy toward the unconditioned, that is to say, toward the absolute good, the total truth, and perfect justice. As I've been suggesting, cultures like individuals are fallen, and to that degree they deviate from the trajectory toward their proper fulfillment. However, according to their own most nature, they maintain an orientation toward the unconditioned under one of its three principal modalities, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Therefore, what does it mean to evangelize a culture? It is, I think, to declare to the representatives and practitioners of the various cultural forms that Jesus Christ is their Lord, and that their work and efforts belong finally to him and find their surest fulfillment in him. There is accordingly something imperial, but not imperious, about this move. The church, as John Paul II, never tired of repeating, only proposes, never imposes. Nevertheless, the evangelization of the culture is ingredient in the overall commission to bring all things under the feet of Christ and to assure that every knee bends at the sounding of his name. Now, to demonstrate what this looks like concretely, and how it does not amount to a sort of religious suppression of culture will be the burden of the rest of this lecture. In order to grasp how the submission of the culture to Jesus is tantamount not to a compromising of cultural integrity, but precisely to its elevation, it's necessary clearly to understand the peculiar nature of the God of whom Jesus is the visible representation. According to the great tradition, stretching from the third chapter of the book of Exodus through Augustine and Aquinas to contemporary thinkers such as Rahner, Balthazar, and Ratzinger, God is not one being among many, but rather the sheer act of being itself, ipsum esse in Aquinas' pithy Latin formula. This means that God does not stand over and against the beings of the world in a competitive attitude, as though he were jockeying for position with them on the same ontological plane. Rather, precisely as radically transcendent to the creaturely mode of existence, he can function as the ground of being of created things. Augustine caught this paradox in his neat observation that God is simultaneously intimior intimo meo, et superior sumo meo. God is closer to me than I am to myself, and radically beyond whatever I can imagine. God, in a word, is not a being, but rather the unconditioned act of being. And therefore, finite things do not compete with him, rather they exist through him and in him. Thomas says that God is, quote, in all things, by essence, presence, and power. But this divine adherence, far from crushing the creature, is instead the condition for the possibility of the creature's existence and ontological integrity. This is the conceptual framework for the familiar adage that gratia supponit et perfecit natura. Grace supposes and perfects nature. For God enhances rather than compromises the created order to which he comes close. Now, since God is the sheer act of to be itself, he must possess the three great transcendental properties of being, namely goodness, truth, and beauty, precisely in their unconditioned form. As Augustine argued, God is not a true thing among many, not one more item that the inquiring mind discovers. Instead, 
God is the truth itself. The illumination by which all true things are seen by the mind. In a similar way, God is not one more good thing to which the will is attracted. Rather, God is the unconditioned good that in turn conditions the will when it goes about its work of seeking good things. Finally, God is not the supreme instance of the category of beauty, but rather the beautiful itself by which and in which all beautiful things are assessed. Paul Tillich here is very much in the Augustinian spirit when he says that God is the great prius, the great prior or first of all thought, action, and striving. And this is why God is the ground of culture, that collection of practices, convictions, and institutions centering around the transcendental properties of being. Now, Jesus is described by Paul as, quote, the icon of the invisible God, which is to say the human face of the unconditioned reality. It must follow, therefore, that in Jesus the divine truth, the divine goodness, and the divine beauty take on visible form and become sacramentally present within the world. For this reason, the church has from the beginning presented Jesus as the ground and lure of culture. The mainstream of the Catholic intellectual tradition has consistently resisted the sectarian impulses of a Tertullian, what is Athens to do with Jerusalem, and it's embraced the broad-minded, culturally engaged theologies of Irenaeus, Origen, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and John Henry Newman. It's realized, in a word, that the Logos made flesh must have an important relationship to the various Logoi spermaticoi, to use the patristic term, the seeds of the word, that appear within the cultural sphere. Now, let's take those transcendental qualities one at a time. If God is the unconditioned truth, and Jesus is God's visible icon, then we should not be surprised that the New Testament writers often employ the category of truth in order to make clear the meaning of Jesus. Thus, St. John insists, as we've seen, that Jesus is the Logos made flesh. And John's Jesus says of himself, I am the truth. He's not one more prophet or philosopher who speaks true things about God. He's instead the embodiment of the divine mind itself, the manifestation of the pattern by which God has fashioned all things. In Luke's account of a journey to Emmaus, the still hidden Christ applies the hermeneutic that enables his dejected disciples to understand the whole of Scripture, and hence the whole of God's purpose. And that interpretive key is none other than his own suffering and death, his willingness to go to the limits of God-forsakenness in order to save those who wandered far from the divine love. In the light of this truth, this pattern, the disciples begin to understand the Bible in its totality, and their hearts burn within them. This great metaphor is evocative of the moment of recognition, when the many disparate elements come together according to a form, what Lonergan called insight, what Wittgenstein termed seeing something as something. The point is that divine love, this radical being for the other, which is the very nature of God, is the truth. It's the pattern that informs reality at its deepest level. And any individual or cultural institution ordered to the truth is ordered finally to this. Now, the second of the transcendentals. If God is unconditioned justice itself, and if Jesus is the icon of the invisible God, then we should not be surprised that the authors of the New Testament often utilize the language and symbolism associated with justice when speaking of Jesus. Law and covenant are obviously massively important themes throughout the Old Testament. Again and again, Yahweh pledges fidelity to his people and invites Israel into a life of holiness, disciplined by the moral, juridical, and ceremonial precepts of the law. He cuts covenants with them, a typical biblical word there, and makes a blood bond with them, first through Noah and Abraham, then through Moses and David. Throughout the history of salvation, the great prophets 
from Amos and Hosea to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, call Israel back to fidelity to the covenant, to meet the divine love with an answering human love. The covenants with Israel are not contracts, exchanges of goods and services, but more like a marriage, a mutual giving of hearts. I will be your God, you will be my people. Now, the first Christians understood Jesus to be the fulfillment of law and the perfection of the covenant. For in his own person, divinity and humanity came together. In Jesus, faithful Yahweh finally met faithful Israel, and a perfect justice thereby appeared in the world. Just as he is the truth in the unconditioned sense, so he is definitively the way and the life. He's the halakha by which humanity walks according to the divine purpose. The central petition of the Our Father, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven, is really a prayer that the justice which obtains in Jesus' own person might become normative throughout creation. Here we can appreciate why St. Paul referred to Jesus as the new Adam. Prior to the fall, Adam walked in easy fellowship with Yahweh. His powers and aspirations aligned to God's will. For the ancient rabbinic interpreters, this made Adam the first priest, adoring God, literally ad ora, mouth to mouth. It made him the first scientist, cataloging, catalogon, the animals, naming them according to the intelligibility placed in them by the Creator. Jesus, the visible icon of the unconditioned justice of God, is hence the one who establishes, on Paul's reading, dikaiosune, justice or righteousness. That this takes place apart from the law is, as Paul insists, not a judgment on the law, but a function of Jesus having brought the law to fulfillment in his own person. What these first Christians saw in Jesus was a human love that answered the divine love so faithfully it allowed grace to flood into the world. In the consistent obedience of Christ, especially in his obedience unto death on the cross, they saw, therefore, the visible icon of unconditioned justice. And this is why any person or cultural institution ordered toward justice is ordered finally toward him. Now, the third of the transcendentals, the beautiful. If God is the unconditioned act of beauty itself and Jesus the icon of the invisible God, then it's only natural that the New Testament would present Christ as supremely beautiful. The event of the transfiguration, during which the splendor of Jesus shone through his ordinary appearance, is the most obvious example of this type of presentation. However, the whole of Jesus' life, including and especially his crucifixion, can be read under the rubric of the beautiful. In order to see this, it might be helpful to attend to Aquinas' classical characterization of beauty as the coming together of integritas, wholeness, consonantia, harmony, and claritas, or radiance. Whether we're describing a beautiful day, a beautiful face, a beautiful golf swing, we're noticing, if Aquinas is right, the coming together of these three essential elements. A beautiful object or picture or idea is marked first by unity or integrity. Despite all of its complexity, it hangs together as one. Kierkegaard commented that a saint, a radiantly beautiful person, is someone whose life is about one thing. Next, the beautiful object or person is marked by harmony or by a consonance of its parts, by a certain logic that obtains in the arrangement of its various elements. One notices consonantia in beautiful golf swings, say those of Ernie Els or Rory McIlroy. Uh, Mike Weir, I should say, up here in Canada now. <laughs> All the twists, angles, turns, and leveraging that go into that notoriously difficult athletic move come together in the swings of those gentlemen in a remarkably elegant manner so that nothing is wasted, nothing is extraneous to the fundamental purpose of the effort. And finally, the beautiful possesses claritas, 
or radiance. A relatively naive reading of the term renders bright and shining colors, and this can indeed be found in some texts of Aquinas. But Jacques Maritain, who taught here, didn't he, uh, and many others observe that a more profound interpretation points to the claritas of what the scholastics call the form. The beautiful is that which discloses in a paradigmatic manner what the thing or event or person ought to be. Upon watching the swing of a McElroy, one's moved to exclaim, now that is a golf swing. After touring Chartres Cathedral, one might be forgiven for thinking, now that is what a Gothic cathedral is supposed to look like. In both cases, the observer is struck by the splendor, the claritas, the radiance of the form. Now, in light of these clarifications, we can begin to see why Jesus' entire way of being in the world should be characterized as beautiful. Jesus was one. What is true of Kierkegaard's saint is a fortiori the case in regard to Jesus. His life was utterly focused on one thing, namely doing the will of his Father. We express this truth in more abstract metaphysical language by speaking of the irreducible unity of Jesus' person, the divine word, which is nothing but a reflection of the being of the Father. But Jesus' integritas, his unity, was accompanied by an equally powerful consonantia. For grounded in the unity of his person were two natures, divine and human, which came together in a harmony of mind, will, and purpose. The two natures maintain their integrity, coming together, as the Council of Chalcedon put it, without mixing, mingling, or confusion. Yet they found harmony in the measure that they both were instantiated in the one divine person. The Gospel accounts of Jesus' words and deeds might be construed as the narrative presentation of precisely this consonancia between the natures. Indeed, the drama of Jesus' life, from his childhood, his public life and preaching, all the way to the cross, is identical to the artful interplay of divine will and human will, divine mind and human mind. And finally, the splendor of both divinity and humanity shone forth in him, for Jesus was the archetypal human, witnessed too ironically by Pilate's delicious ecce homo. I mean, there's the man, there's humanity. And the manifestation of divinity within history, as indicated by the Apostle Thomas's ecstatic, my Lord and my God, at the end of John's Gospel. In him, therefore, the form of humanity and the form of God both become radiant and luminous. Once more, the essential quality of this beautiful display was love, for the characteristic mark of the consonancia between divinity and humanity in Jesus was a mutual surrendering, a giving away for the other. In Christ, the divine love for us, God so loved the world, he sent his only son, met in a splendid harmony, the human love for God. I've come to do the will of my Father in heaven. And thus, unconditioned beauty appeared. And this is why any cultural institution dedicated to the production of the beautiful is ordered finally to Christ. With these analyses in mind, let's turn to a consideration of some concrete ways in which Christ can be proposed as the proper fulfillment of the culture according to its three transcendental trajectories. We'll look, however, briefly at Jesus' relationship to the sciences, to politics, and to the arts. Especially in the North American context, the quest for truth is typically associated with the endeavor of scientists. We've come, with good reason, to reverence the sciences for their practical effectiveness, as well as for their clarity and exactitude. And we've benefited enormously from their attendant technologies, which have gone a long way toward realizing Descartes' dream at the very dawn of modernity, that humans might come to master nature. But sadly, part of the mythology associated with the emergence of modernity is that science and religion are implacable enemies, and that the physical sciences emerged only after a long twilight struggle against superstition and the claims of faith. Robert Sokolowski suggested that the constant iteration of this myth up to the present day has something of the quality of a ritual retelling or rehearsal 
as though moderns have continually to remind themselves of the painful process by which they were born intellectually. Hypatia, Giordano, Bruno, and especially Galileo have become the patron saints of critical reason persecuted by intolerant religion. The great battle between science and biblical fundamentalism in my country in the early years of the 20th century, culminating in the Scopes trial, are read as a continuation of the primal struggle between obscurantism and enlightenment. Watch Bill Maher's, I think, terrible film, Religious, in order to see a contemporary and very crude retelling of the myth. But all of this is tragic. There have been undoubtedly missteps on both sides, clearly. Nevertheless, science and authentic faith ought never to be construed as enemies, just the contrary. Despite the persistence of this modern myth of origins, the physical sciences were born precisely out of an intellectual matrix, conditioned by the faith. One might wonder why the sciences in their modern form emerged when and where they did, which is to say in a European civilization of the 17th century, and not in the cultural context of, say, India, China, or the Middle East. Peter Hodgson and many others have argued that the condition for the possibility of the rise of the experimental sciences was a pair of fundamental assumptions, both theological in nature. In order for the sciences to flourish, Intellectuals had first to see the world as non-divine and second as intelligible. As long as the universe itself is construed as sacred, as is the case in most forms of animism, pantheism, and nature mysticism, it is the object not of experimentation and rational analysis, but of worship. And before any scientific work can get off the ground, scientists must presume the intelligibility of what they seek to investigate. Psychology rests upon the assumption that the psyche has an intelligible form. Biology on the assumption that life is understandable. Physics on the assumption that there's a law-like quality to the microcosmic and macrocosmic structures of the universe, etc. This universal intelligibility is not so much discovered by scientists as intuited by them. Both of these requisite presumptions should be seen as corollaries of the doctrine of creation. And that's why I say they are theological in nature. If God has made the world in its entirety from nothing, then the world is not God. And if the Creator is intelligent, then His work is stamped necessarily and universally by intelligibility. The contention of Hodgson and many others is that an intellectual culture shaped by the doctrine of creation provided a particularly healthy breeding ground for the physical sciences. More to it, many of the first great practitioners of modern science, think of Descartes, Pascal, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, etc., were devoutly religious men and were keen to show the correspondences between their empirical discoveries and their faith. And they all learned their mathematics, astronomy, and physics in church-sponsored universities. After the founding period, many prominent scientists saw no contradiction at all between their empirical research and their faith. One thinks here of Gregor Mendel, the founder of modern genetics, and an Augustinian friar, of Georges Lemaitre, formulator of the Big Bang theory of cosmic origins, and a Catholic priest, or today of a John Polkinghorne, Cambridge particle physicist and Anglican priest, and of George Coyne, Jesuit priest and astrophysicist. The myth of the war between science and religion was largely an invention, I would say, of the anti-Catholic polemicists of the 19th century. But it was sadly confirmed in my country by the emergence of biblical fundamentalism in the early 20th century. But the best of the Catholic tradition, relying on nuanced, non-literalistic, patristic, and medieval strategies for reading the scripture, managed for the most part to avoid this phony conflict. And that's why the Galileo case, in all of its ambiguity, should be read as a tragic anomaly rather than as paradigmatic of the church's relationship to the sciences. Those who honor the Logos made flesh, the one who's the icon of the invisible God, meaning the icon of unconditioned truth, have absolutely no interest in blocking, hindering, or questioning the legitimate exercise of reason in any of its forms. Just the contrary. As I take the next step, I realize I'm moving into rather highly speculative territory, but I believe there are intriguing hints in a good deal of contemporary science that the Logos, 
which we say informs all of reality, is, as Christians would expect, marked by a kind of being with or being for. Classical physics and astronomy were predicated on the assumption that reality is made up of separately existing objects relating to one another extrinsically within the great theater of space. But post-Einsteinian physics, and now quantum theory even more radically, tend to see not so much things as patterns of interaction, overlapping fields of energy, what Charles Williams called coherence, the interpenetration of all dimensions of reality, seems to obtain at the most fundamental levels of being. The EPR experiment, Bell's theorem, both indicate that certain subatomic particles, having been at one time in contact, continue to be marked by one another, even after they've been separated by enormous amounts of space and time. Does this action at a distance or non-local causality, in fact, suggest a kind of coherence or being with, obtaining across the fields of reality. And might this line of thought be a fruitful entree for those who hold that the intelligibility that informs all of creation is precisely an intelligibility of love. Now, let's turn to a consideration of the cultural trajectory in the direction of justice. As we argued above, all of our legal, juridical, and political institutions, at least ideally, are ordered toward the achievement of justice. They operate under the aegis of justice in its unconditioned form, which is just another way of saying they operate under God. There's a myth concerning the origins of the modern political state, which curiously mirrors the myth of the emergence of the modern sciences. Many in the West would blithely assume that democratic political reforms emerged after a terrible struggle with the traditional monarchy f uh, favored by the church. Again, it's instructive to consult the ruminations of both popular and academic authors in the 19th century to witness the launching of this myth. But like its scientific counterpart, it's woefully inadequate to the facts. I would argue that many of the indispensable features of the modern democracies are in fact derived from biblical religion. In order to see this, I'd invite you to journey in imagination to a stuffy room in a Philadelphia boarding house in the summer of 1776 where a young Virginia lawyer is composing a rather important document. In the prologue to the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now we've heard those words so often, we rarely aver to their peculiarity. Are all people equal? If so, how? Common sense tells us that human beings are radically unequal in beauty, intelligence, courage, virtue, kindness, physical strength, etc. And if we consult the history of political philosophy, we find that most of the great political theorists of the pre-modern times took it as self-evident that we're not equal. Indeed, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero considered the recognition of this inequality as the requisite to the establishment of a right social order. Think of Plato's account of the three types of people, gold, silver, and bronze, or of Aristotle's sharp distinction between the relatively few aristocrats capable of public life and the vast unwashed destined by nature to remain in the private sphere. So what led Jefferson to say that the equality of all people is not obviously false, but obviously true? I believe the clue is found in that single word of Jefferson's formula that our eyes and minds barely take in, namely the word created. Despite our numerous and massive inequalities, we are all equally children of God, created out of love and destined for eternal life. Take the fact of creation out of consideration and it becomes extremely difficult to defend the proposition that we're all equal. And let's follow the momentum of Jefferson's theologic. I'm quoting again. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Once more, even a casual consultation of the history of political theory discloses that this claim is anything but universally admitted. Neither Plato nor Aristotle would ever have thought it correct to ascribe to all people within the city inalienable rights. Rather, both would hold that the privileged aristocracy, the moral and intellectual elite, alone enjoy certain prerogatives. Again, what prompted Jefferson's confident assertion? It was his keen sense however attenuated by Enlightenment deism, that a creator God had granted to each of his rational creatures a dignity which no person 
or state institution could legitimately undermine. In point of fact, the structures of government exist for no other reason than to protect this God-granted dignity. And here we see something of central importance, namely that the justice which properly preoccupies the representatives of a Jeffersonian democracy is a type of love, a willing the good of the other as other. All of the juridical and political institutions that rest upon the suppositions of the Declaration of Independence are conditioned, it seems to me, finally by this focused desire that each member of the polity flourish. If one is tempted to question the validity of this analysis, I might invite him to consider the example of the great totalitarianisms of the last century. Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Soviet Union, Mao's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, to name only the most brutal. What the world witnessed in each of these political arrangements was a systematic negation of God, and hence a setting aside of both equality and rights, followed by morally disastrous but utterly predictable results. Another important religious feature of modern political arrangements is the rule of law, which is to say the conscious placing of all members of the society, including the governors, under the authority of a law that transcends their individual wills. Grounded in the prophetic tradition of the Bible, Thomas Aquinas teaches that legitimate positive law rests in the moral law, which in turn is conditioned by the eternal law, which is identical to the divine mind itself. When that nesting relationship is forgotten, law in short order becomes an instrument of manipulation, a tool in the hands of the powerful. In his conversation with Pontius Pilate, Jesus reminds the Roman governor that he, Pilate, would have no authority unless it were granted to him from above. In other words, he suggests none too subtly that Pilate's power is not a function of the governor's will, but is rather granted to him by a transcendent authority. The justice of God, which is unconditioned love, is the aegis under which any and all governmental authority is appropriately exercised. And this is precisely why the rule of law provides indirectly an opening to the one who would seek to proclaim Christ to the political culture. Let's look finally at the cultural trajectory in the direction of the beautiful. There was for centuries a tight correlation between the Catholic Church and the arts. One has only to think of Gregorian chant, the great French cathedrals, Dante, Palestrina, Giotto, Raphael, Michelangelo, Matthias Grunewald, Mozart, etc., to see the immensely fruitful quality of this relationship. The church readily used the arts for evangelical purposes, and the artists allowed religion to carry them to the heights of creative expressiveness. Would Grunewald's artistry have been fully realized apart from the unsurpassably sublime subject matter of the crucifixion of the Son of God? The rapport between art and the church was considered natural because God was construed as the supreme artist and artists here below as participants in the divine creativity. Thomas Aquinas utilizes the trope of God the artist frequently and in a number of different contexts. In his discussion of the Trinitarian persons, for example, he says that spacies, beauty, should be attributed to the Son, since the Son is the archetype by which God the Father fashioned the universe. I'm quoting here, the word in a certain sense is the art of Almighty God, that through which all things exist. The Father makes the word, world by consulting, as it were, the beautiful forms implicitly ingredient in the word, much as an artist makes an artifact by consulting a beautiful ideal that he holds in his mind. And since God's creation is ex nihilo, there's literally no limit to the extent of the Son's influence over creation. And this means that whatever exists, precisely in the measure that it exists, is beautiful. What the artist seeks to do on Thomas's reading is to imitate the beautiful forms that she finds in God's creation, and thereby to bring more beauty into being. And this is why artistry is inescapably intellectual in nature. It is, in Thomas's language, rectoratio factibilium, right reason in regard to things to be made. It's a kind of contemplative seeing that gives rise to making. James Joyce, who was profoundly shaped by scholasticism as a young man, expresses the artist's task in very Thomistic terms, commenting that an artist is a, quote, reporter of epiphanies, those privileged moments of manifestation. He's not so much an inventor as an imitator of the beautiful, as becomes clear in Joyce's recounting in A Portrait of the Artist of his experience of seeing the girl 
silhouetted against the sea, a scene which consciously echoes Dante's meeting with Beatrice in the Vita Nuova. But much of this began to unravel in the modern period. An even relatively adequate exploration of the causes for this dissolution would take us way beyond the bounds of this paper. But suffice to say that the participation metaphysics that undergirded the, uh, the approach outlined above commenced to even as, as God more and more was seen as a distant first cause and not as the very ground of the being of the universe. In time, this abstracted and distanciated God came to be seen by many intellectuals as effectively unnecessary, and eventually an outright atheism came to seem plausible. This shift in ontology carried enormous implications for aesthetics, for as the world appeared less and less the work of a transcendent artist, art became more and more a matter of self-expression rather than imitation. Once the objective referent disappeared, subjective purpose and need became paramount in the mind of the artist. It seems to me that the evangelization of the arts can happen only when we recover a more classical notion of nature as the repository of formal beauty, the work of a transcendent artist, and of art itself as recta ratio factibilium, a rightly ordered reason that contemplates the objective form and makes beautiful things in accord with that contemplation. Once these moves are made, the evangelist can propose Jesus, who is the harmonious coming together of divinity and humanity, as the most sublimely beautiful form. And he can endeavor to show that any and all forms within nature are finally a participation in that primordial beauty. And finally, he can encourage artists to return with energy and enthusiasm to the community, which has, up and down the ages, most faithfully preserved the idea of the supernatural artist. Just now a couple words by way of conclusion. The great story of Noah's Ark in the book of Genesis was interpreted by the church fathers as a kind of icon of the church. During a time of crisis, Noah and his family, along with the microcosm of God's good creation, hunkered down. But the moment the floodwaters receded, Noah opened the windows and doors of the ship in order to flood the world with the life he'd preserved. So the church, down through the ages, is a place of refuge where something of God's good order is preserved. But the ultimate purpose of the church is not to hunker down behind walls, but rather to flood the world with the ideas and practices that have been cultivated. This is, I suggest, a provocative image for the evangelization of the culture. Christians must vigorously resist the modern prejudice in favor of a privatized religion, the faith that speaks of the logos by which all things were created cannot even in principle remain privatized. The church must come out from behind its walls, non-violently to be sure, but with confidence and panache in order to share its life everywhere and with everyone. One of the very last images in the Bible at the close of the book of Revelation is the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem. The visionary sees the great city illumined by the light of the Lamb, adorned with jewels and, the, and filled with streets of gold. And he notices there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. Certainly a curious state of affairs given the prominence of the temple in the earthly Jerusalem. But we're meant to see is that there's no need for a temple precisely because the city in its entirety has become a temple, which is to say a place where God is properly praised. This is an image of the evangelized culture in which the arts, the sciences, politics, sports, finance, and law are all ordered finally to Christ, the icon of the invisible God, the human face of the unconditioned good, true, and beautiful. Thanks for listening tonight.